In today's MLB, walking is better than running. After all, a walk is one of the three true outcomes that have come to define the game, and running, well, running can get you thrown out. You only get 27 outs per game, so that's probably not smart, right? Well, it's complicated. During the 2022 season, the game's greatest players swiped 2,487 bases, which might seem like grand larceny until you realize that in 1987, the total number of stolen bases was 3,585, which means there's been a drop of 30.6% since. But it's actually more nuanced than that, because in 1987, there were just 26 MLB teams, not 30. The average per team in 1987 was 137.9 stolen bases, whereas last season, the average per team was 82.9, which means the drop was actually closer to 40%. So what happened? The baselines didn't get any longer, though the bases will grow next year. The players didn't get any slower. In fact, if anything, thanks to StatCast, we know more about players' speed than ever before in recorded history. For example, according to 2022 data, the player with the fastest sprint speed in MLB was the D-backs Corbin Carroll, who can burn up to 30.7 feet per second. Despite that incredible burst, Carroll stole just two bases in 115 plate appearances, which means in a whole season, he might steal just 10 bags. Corbin Carroll was born to run. He's a veritable human cheetah, but when he's on first base, you can probably go refill your tub of popcorn, because chances are you won't miss much. He isn't going anywhere. When the fastest players become spectators in the base paths, something fundamental has changed in baseball strategy. If Corbin Carroll was playing in 1987, he'd be pushing the league leaders and maybe looking to swipe close to 100. Today, like many fast runners in the MLB, Carroll won't or isn't allowed to risk it. So what or who killed stolen bases? And will new rules bring back this dying art? Now let's take a trip back in time to 1960. The stolen base wasn't a big factor, with a per team average of 57.9 stolen bases per season less than the current rate. Throughout the 1950s, stealing bases had fallen out of favor, with so many power hitters in the MLB. For example, in 1956, every team had crushed over 100 home runs except one, the Orioles. Many years, teams would have more caught stealings than actual stolen bases. They played the classic Earl Weaver game just wait for that three-run homer. But trends began to shift in the 1960s, with the arrival of some all-time great stolen base leaders. Maury Wills set an MLB record in 1962 with 104 steals, and his numbers made front offices take notice. The stolen base could become a weapon, not just a one-time ploy. Lou Brock, Luis Apricio, and Burt Campaneris would establish themselves as threats to take off, and through the 1960s, the league's stolen base numbers increased. By the mid-70s, the stolen base had erupted. Lou Brock broke Will's record in 1974 by stealing 118 bags. Joe Morgan, Bobby Bonds, Don Baylor, and Reggie Jackson all had elite power and speed, whereas the power hitter of the 1960s was more along the lines of Harmon Kilbrew bulky and slow afoot. By the mid-1970s, MLB teams were stealing over 3,000 bases, which hadn't happened since 1915. Batting averages were also down, and teams needed to find creative ways to score. All this set the stage for the race in 80s, when stealing bases was an instrumental part of winning baseball strategy. New ballparks definitely played a role. The Royals had to deal with the cavernous Kauffman Stadium, while the Reds played at expansive Riverfront. The Pirates occupied three rivers, and the Cardinals toiled away at Bush. None of the ballparks could be considered cozy, and if a team like the Royals lacked a true power threat, they had to get someone on, get them over, and get them in. In 1979, that job belonged to Willie Wilson, who led the league with 82 steals. Lou Brock pioneered this data-driven approach, bringing a scientific rigor to stealing bases that then spread to the entire league. And it worked out. Sort of. By the end of the 1970s, base runners were successful stealing bases around 65-68% to 68 of the time, an improvement from the 1960s, when the success rate was about 5 points lower. So conditions were ripe in the 1980s for teams to run with wild abandon. What also fueled the surge was the arrival of three of the greatest base stealers of all time, Ricky Henderson, Tim Raines, and Vince Coleman. Henderson ended up with 1,408 steals, the only player to pass the 1,000 steal mark. Raines is 5th all time, and Coleman is 6th. During the 1980s, stealing 40 bases in a season might have snuck into the top 10, whereas today, it would easily lead the league. Henderson and Reigns litter the MLB record book. Henderson stole three or more bases in a game 71 times in his career. He stole over 100 bases after he turned 40. Fun fact, he's the all-time leader in walks, excluding intentional walks, and homers to lead off a game with 81. Reigns, on the other hand, has the highest all-time stolen base percentage mark at 84.7%. Coleman needed just 804 games to steal 500 bases, the fastest in MLB history, and he remains the last player to steal 100 bags in a season. 
So was it just luck that these three all-time greats converged at the same time? Or is there another explanation for why the 1980s saw a tremendous upswing in stolen bases? The fact is, only once in the decade did the success rate reach 70%. Runners were running, and runners were getting thrown out. Henderson is the all-time leader in caught stealing, don't forget. But he also scored 2,295 runs, the most all-time. So did his stolen base prowess in fact help him score runs? This is where it gets tricky. Some analysts looking at Ricky's historic 1982 season, where he swiped 130 bases, concluded that his steals added about 22.2 runs to the A's offense. But that season, he was snagged 42 times, which cost the team 20.6 runs by the same measurements, for a net gain of just 1.6 runs. Other data gurus calculated 5.3 runs instead. What gives? From a data standpoint, stolen bases were more valuable in the 1980s because runs were harder to come by. In the 1970s and 80s, if a player stole 40 bases out of 50 tries, 80% success rate, the overall run contribution was calculated to be 2.9, but that same scenario in 2018 would have yielded just 2.3 runs, again because of the higher run climate today. Basically, stealing bases were integral to winning in the 1980s, but all that was about to change. Were the old timers better than today's players? It's a great argument to have after a couple shots of Jägermeister, but you can say with 100% certainty that today's players are bigger than yesterday's. The average major leaguer today stands 6'2 and weighs 209 pounds. Back in the 1980s, the average was closer to 6'1 and 190. Positions where you typically found base dealers, like short and second, have seen big increases in weight, but not necessarily height. The average shortstop weighed 170 pounds in 1980, and by 2007, the mean had climbed to 170. But do bigger players mean less running? Not necessarily. What changed, starting in 1990 but accelerating into our current era, was the percent of runs being scored by the long ball. What also changed in the late 1980s was the burgeoning field of sabermetrics, or the data science of baseball, which tried to quantify the common wisdom of the game. For example, that base stealing helps a team score more runs. In effect, can the value of a stolen base be transformed into a number instead of just blind faith? The general consensus is that a player has to be successful at least 67% of the time in order for a net effect to be positive, because a stolen base might add 0.3 to expected runs scored, but a caught stealing subtracts 0.7. When in the 1980s teams had to string together hits to score, a stolen base had more value therefore. But with power hitters on the rise in the 1990s, this calculation changed. A caught stealing before a Mark McGuire at bat was potentially ruinous. So running began to decline. Here's a frequent objection. What about the pressure that a base dealer puts on the pitcher? Again, this is another battle that rages between purists and data heads. Of course, someone like Ricky Henderson made pitchers sweat, right? And of course, that had a positive effect. The data, however, tells another story. One study found that between 1989 and 2002, there was no correlation between a rise in batting average or slugging and having a runner at first base, making the pitcher sweat. Yet, it's a part of the game that purists appreciate, that cat and mouse element between a hurler with a good move and an aggressive base dealer who wants to move up. It's hard to tell for sure. To some degree, it's the same numbers game we've been playing with batting average for years. What is the real worth of a stolen base, and how do we quantify that? It's an ongoing question. All we know is that fast players who steal bases at a success rate above 75% per our current mathematical understanding add value to their team by doing so, even in today's high-octane power-based game. So why aren't fast players who can successfully steal bases at a high clip doing just that? Well, while it's romantic to look at baseball as a sport, it's not. It's a business, and it's cutthroat, and if the game can't deliver what the fans want, fans will find something else to do. What fans clamored for in the 1990s was the long ball. Chicks dug the long ball. And after a disastrous strike in 1994 which cancelled the World Series, fans were slow to come back to the national pastime. The strike endured into the 1995 season as well, and per game attendance figures plummeted from a pre-strike high of 31,000 to just 25,000 after the strike. Then the bashing really began. Or the balls got juiced. The players definitely got juiced. The net result was that homers started to rise. Back when Ricky was running amok on the bases, there were fewer than 3,500 homers hit from 1981 to 1984. Here's some more perspective. By 2018, the league median for percent of runs scored via the home run was 40.2%, but during the entirety of the 1980s, only eight individual teams achieved this. Then came the miracle year of 1998, when baseball was finally able to put the shame of a canceled World Series behind it, and the nation watched in awe as two very talented cheaters launched baseball at a prodigious rate. Both Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa broke the hollowed Major League record of 61 home runs in a season set by Yankee Roger Maris in 1961. McGuire cranked out 70, and Sosa hammered 66, and they grew into living legends who spoke to the game's broad appeal. That both were doping didn't factor into the adulation. The country was falling in love with baseball all over again. 
When Barry Bonds made a run at McGuire's record in 2001, the sheen had worn off. Rumors were swirling about steroid use, and fans spent time looking at pictures of a young and thin Barry Bonds compared to an older, thicker Barry Bonds whose cranium seemed to have enlarged as well. Didn't matter. The fans kept coming to see the chemically induced spectacle, with balls flying out of ballparks, to the tune of 5,623 in 2000, the all-time record, which was since broken in 2017, and the attendance averages spilled over 32,000 per game by 2008. What had been a cerebral game of intricate moves and counter moves had morphed into a slugfest. As homers started flying in the 1990s, runners stopped trying to steal. Between 2003 and 2010, MLB didn't surpass 3,000 steals in a season. No one's career illustrates the diminished role of the stolen base like Mike Trout's. When Mike Trout burst onto the scene in 2012, he flirted with joining the 4040 club as a rookie. Instead, he only hit 32 homers. And so his ascendancy into the elite, where Jose Canseco, Barry Bonds, Alex Rodriguez, and Alfonso Soriano reside, would have to wait. We're still waiting. After his rookie season, Trout has never had another 33 year. He hit over 30 homers seven times, but what he wasn't doing anymore was stealing bases. Trout is one of the greatest athletes to ever play the game, a rare combination of elite power and speed, who rarely gets thrown out while stealing, a career success rate of 84.6%, but who has battled injuries at times. But when he was healthy, like in 2019 when he belted 45 homers, he swiped just 11 bags. The 4040 club has become a lonely place, since no one's joined it since 2006. MLB set a record in 2019 with 6,776 dingers launched, and yet talents like Prime Christian Yelich and Cody Bellinger, as well as the emerging Ronald Acuna, didn't run enough to qualify. Jose Canseco, for all his flaws, and they were numerous, took pride in being the world's first 40-40 player. But 40-40 doesn't guarantee a superstar anymore. Same with batting average or wins for a pitcher. Now even the casual fan has access to barrel rate, launch angle, fly ball percentage, and all the wonderful StatCast tools that are loud and bold, but don't necessarily help measure the exact value of a stolen base as of yet. Here comes the beauty of Jose Ramirez. Jose Ramirez isn't very fast, grading out just above the MLB average. Like, there are hundreds of players faster than he is, yet he swipes bags. His career success rate is 80.5%, above that minimum 75% I mentioned earlier. It's like Ramirez didn't get the memo that superstars don't run, or that guys with average speed shouldn't try stealing. He plays a different sport than his peers, because on paper he shouldn't be running at all. Players around him may have gotten bigger, but he is built like the 1970s prototype of a second baseman or shortstop. A major sticking point in this whole debacle is what I mentioned earlier, caught stealing percentage. Again, if you have a success rate of above 75%, it is a guarantee you will help your team score more runs. That's a verifiable fact. However, players like Jose Altuve, who swiped 56 bases in 2014, said he'd never come close to that again because of the perceived injury risk involved. But there's only one issue with this assertion. No study has proven a correlation between stealing and increased injury risk, even if it may seem obvious. By that measure, then, baseball teams should prevent pitchers from throwing over 95 miles per hour, because hard throwers tear UCLs at a higher rate. There's a risk to throwing hard. Getting injured in a sport comes with the territory. It's hard to imagine hearing John Morant say he's going to stop dunking on people because he might get hurt. This brings us to the fact that today's baseball players are largely injured from high octane movement pattern overuse. Throwing too much, too hard, swinging too much, too hard. Players have evolved to be precise with their training as well, and a huge part of said training for most is endurance training. And frankly, if you have the speed necessary to even attempt 50 stolen bases, you probably also have the athleticism to avoid most injuries sliding. Baseball rules are changing for 2023, and one might result in fixing our problem. The first one has the most potential. Pitchers can only disengage the rubber twice during a plate appearance with runners on. Translation, pitchers can only try two pickoffs. A third will grant the runner a base. In the minors, this new rule has already created more chances for steals, especially when a pitcher uses up all of the pickoff throws involved. After the second, the base runner can take a longer, more aggressive lead, and with catcher pop times and pitcher delivery times already well known by all MLB teams, an extra foot might give runners more green lights. Speaking of extra room, the bases will be bigger too. 18 square inches versus 15 square inches. Those three inches might mean a fast, agile runner like Corbin Carroll will hardly ever get thrown out, but with larger sliding zones leading to more successful swim moves, meaning bang bang plays will almost always go to the runner. These rule changes were needed because teams weren't running like they were in the 1980s or even the 70s, but they were running more than they did in the 50s and 60s. With the time between batted balls and play reaching at times up to four minutes, MLB realized that there needed to be more action on the bases or younger fans would never embrace the game. 
The triple is the most exciting play in baseball, second for second, and watching fast runners sprinting has always been a thrill for spectators for thousands of years after all. Baseball is trying to bring back that element of the game, and allow the next Ricky Henderson, Vince Coleman, or Tim Raines to emerge. And I have to say, I'm all here for it. A quick note before we go, again, I'm not saying that as a blanket statement every player needs to steal more bases. That would be ludicrous. Yasmani Grandal, for example, rounds the bases at the same speed my grandma climbs the stairs. He wouldn't get more than two all season no matter how much he ran. It's about unleashing those players like Carroll, like Trey Turner before his prime fades, like the Billy Hamilton of 2013 to 2016, to really have free reign on the bases to steal 60 to 80 bases a year with their 75% plus success rate. Players are being actively discouraged from that practice now, and for some of them, I really do believe it's undermining their overall value, as well as the fan experience. Have a great day everyone, and check out this playlist for more MLB essay vids just like this.